Okay, so we are talking about unstated premises uh, in this lecture. Now, the idea is in real life, when people talk, when people write stuff, we don't always necessarily talk, give full arguments, right? We're not robots and machines in that way. We'll oftentimes say something that we mean to be an argument and just leave out some premises because it's kind of obvious. They're kind of implied just by the context of the discussion. So these are referred to as unstated premises. For example, if I said something like, John is wearing his lucky cologne. He has a hot date tonight. There could be an unstated premise that says something like, well, you know what? When John wears, when John always wears his lucky cologne, well, he has a hot date. This is the premise that's kind of assumed, right? It's the, it's the dot that's, it's the, it's the dot that's connecting um, the the two claims that are given to us. John is wearing his like a cologne. He has a hot date. Well, there must be some relationship between wearing cologne and a hot date. So that relationship is stated in the unstated premise. It's kind of implied that John, you know, usually wears his lucky cologne, always wears his lucky cologne, has a tendency to wear his lucky cologne when he has a hot date. Right now, the way the um, the unstated premise is phrased will make this particular argument deductive or inductive. When we say John always wears his lucky cologne when he has a hot date, well, that makes it so that this becomes a deductive argument. Because if we know for sure John is wearing his lucky cologne, and if John always wears his lucky cologne when he has a hot date, then we know for sure that John has a hot date, right? It is, um, it is necessarily true that given the first two claims, John, uh, this conclusion has to be true. Now, we can rephrase the unstated premise to make it inductive. If we say, John, you know, usually wears his lucky cologne when he has a hot date, or when we say, or if we said, John, you know, often wears his lucky cologne when he has a hot date. Well, then that kind of makes the argument uh, a, well, that makes the argument an inductive one since the premises, you know, kind of infer the conclusion. So the tricky part is obviously that unstated premises are not stated. So how do you know if what is meant by the argument is a deductive argument or a inductive argument? You have to read between the lines. You have to um, get a sense based upon context uh, what type of unstated premise is implied by the way the person is talking to you. Okay? <clears throat> so if I said something like, that dog is a pit bull, it's mean for sure. Well, it can be an inductive argument if we say to ourselves, well, what this person is missing, what they're leaving out is the premise that, you know, lots of pit bulls are mean. By saying lots of pit bulls are mean, it's kind of implying that this dog is mean because it's a pit bull. In order to make this a deductive argument, to make it so that the premises necessarily lead to the conclusion, you would say something like, you know, all pit bulls are mean, right? Then it is necessarily true, it has to be true, that since this dog is a pit bull, it is mean. Okay? So whether you have a deductive or inductive argument depends on how you are thinking about the unstated premise. And sometimes, obviously, it's not so easy to tell. So sometimes we don't really know. If I said to you, Mr. Porker is a Democrat. After all, he teaches English. You can make this a deductive or inductive argument. If you said, you know, lots of English teachers are Democrats, well, lots doesn't mean all of them are. So there's a good chance that Mr. Porker is a Democrat because he's an English teacher. Uh, but it's, it may not be true because he could be one of those that aren't, uh, that are English teachers but are not Democrats. You can make this a deductive argument if you were to say, all English teachers are Democrats, because if they are all Democrats and Mr. Porker is an English teacher, then it has to be the case that he's a Democrat. So unstated premises can be 
can lead to in, uh, making an argument inductive or deductive. Um, again, sometimes we can get a sense for that based upon the context of the discussion, and sometimes we just don't know, right? So take a look at exercise 2-11, numbers 1 through 5, and 2-12, uh, numbers 1 through 5. Take a second, pause the video, and come back, and then we'll review the answers together. So hopefully you had a chance to take a look at those exercises. Um, you're being asked to write an unstated premise that would turn the argument that's given into a deductive one. So if I said something like, Jamal keeps his word, so he is a man of good character, I'm trying to prove to you, or I'm trying to um, have you believe that Jamal is a man of good character. And the reason I... Uh, the reason I'm giving to believe that he's a man of good character is that he keeps his word. So the unstated premise has to do with relating people who keep their word to being good men, right? Men of good character. So let's see if you came up with a uh, an unstated premise that would make this deductive. If um, <clears throat> if I said to you, all men of good character keep their word, if I said that was the unstated premise, is it necessarily true that Jamal is a man of good character? Think about this carefully. We know that Jamal keeps his word. If the unstated premise is that all men of good character keep their word, does it necessarily mean it's true that Jamal is a man of good character. In this case, no, right? Because just because all men of good character keep the word doesn't mean that everybody who keeps their word are men of good character. It's not the same. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, one doesn't necessarily mean the other. If I said to you all Filipinos are Asian, it does not mean all Asians are Filipinos. Right? So just because you say all men of good character keep the word doesn't mean that everybody who keeps their word are men of good character. So this particular phrasing for the unstated premise would only make the argument inductive. It would not make it deductive. It wouldn't make it so that the conclusion has to be true. If I said to you all men of good character always keep their word, again we run into the same sort of problem right? Just because all men of good character always keep their word doesn't mean that people, all people who keep their word are always men of good character. They don't imply the same thing. It's the same issue we had with the previous one. If I said to you, men of good character usually keep their word, well, the term usually leaves us some wiggle room, right? Um, so this only implies the conclusion. It doesn't prove it to be true. But if I said something like, anyone who keeps their word is a person of good character, then it is necessarily true that uh, Jamal is a man of good character. This example plays with what's referred to as categorical logic. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a tricky thing, right? If you're having difficulty intuitively seeing the difference between all of these different unstated premises, later on the term, we'll take a look at how to draw these things out so we can visually see the difference. But I like the example I gave earlier, right? I'll give you another one. If I said something like, all uh, De Anza students are human, well, that doesn't also mean that all humans are De Anza students, right? One statement doesn't mean the other statement. And it's important how those statements are phrased when trying to determine whether or not it helps a argument become inductive or deductive. Okay, let's take a look at number two. Betty got an A in the course, so she must have received an A on the final. Okay, so first premise, Betty got an A in the course. Conclusion is that, well, then she must have received an A in the final. So there has to be some sort of unstated premise that relates getting an A in the course and getting an A in the final. So what sort of unstated premise would make this argument deductive? Well, let's take a look. 
A. Some people who got an A in the course got an A in the final. Well, that word some should tell you that we're not talking about all of something. So there's some wiggle room. So it's uh, the, the, the argument doesn't necessarily lead to a conclusion having to be true. Everyone who got an A in the course got an A in the final. Hmm? Some people who got an A in the final got an A in the course. Again, the word some kind of gives us some wiggle room there, so it's not necessarily true um, that the conclusion is true. Everyone who got an A on the final got an A in the course. So hopefully quickly you can see it's between B and D. So now it's just about reasoning through to see which premise necessarily leads to the conclusion. So the conclusion is she must have received an A in the final. Well, why must she have received an A in the final? Well, because she got an A in the course. So what, what's missing is the idea that everybody who got an A in the course got an A on the final. Because that's what we're trying to prove, right? We're trying to prove that she got an A in the final. The reason to believe it is she got an A in the course. So it must be the case that everybody who got an A in the course got an A on the final. So that was B. Three, Iraq posed a threat to us. So we had a right to invade it. Okay, so... We have a premise that Iraq posed a threat to us. We have a conclusion, so we had a right to invade it. So there has to be some sort of unstated premise that relates, you know, um, somebody posing a threat to having a right to invade. Okay, so what do you think? How did you phrase the unstated premise to make this deductive? Did you say we have a right to invade any country that poses a threat to us? So Iraq posed a threat to us. We have a right to invade any country that poses a threat to us. Therefore, so we had a right to invade it. Yeah, that works. Oh, in case I just moved back too fast. All right, so this works. Um, let's take a look at the next one. Colonel Mustard could not have murdered Professor Plum because the two men were in separate rooms when the professor was killed. Okay, so the conclusion is that first claim, right? that um, Colonel Mustard could not have murdered Professor Plum. Well, why do we believe that? We believe that because the two men were in separate rooms when the professor was killed. So the unstated premise has to tie in being in separate rooms and not being able to commit a murder. So what would the unstated premise sound like to make this a deductor argument? Well, one person cannot murder another without being in the same room, right? That's the unstated premise. It's kind of take it for granted, right? It's kind of already implied within the argument without actually saying it out loud, without actually saying it overtly, explicitly. Um, but that would be the unstated premise. Now, obviously you can word these things a little bit differently. You know, a person cannot murder another person without being in the same room. I mean, that's the same sort of meaning. So. Um, if you are unclear about what you wrote, if what you wrote is, uh, is a claim that would make this argument deductive, you can always um, get a hold of me somehow and try to uh, verify what you wrote. Uh, number five, Avril is no liberal since she voted against gun control. So here they're trying to prove to us that Avril is not liberal. What's the reason they give to prove Avril is not liberal? Well, the reason is that she voted against gun control. So then we need some sort of unstated premise that says, you know, that everyone who votes against gun control are not liberal, right? So something along those lines. Okay, so exercise 2-12. Now we're being asked to create an unstated premise that turns this into an inductive argument. Okay, inductive. So not necessarily proving the glitch to be true, but just kind of implying it, inferring it, evidence for it without actually proving it to be true. There are puddles everywhere. It must have rained recently. Okay, so the conclusion that they are trying to make us believe is that it must have rained recently. Well, why? Why should I believe it must have rained recently? Because, look, there's puddles everywhere. Right? So that's your premise to believe the conclusion that it must have rained recently. So what sort of unstated premise would make this 
an inductive argument? Well, you need some sort of premise that talks about how when there are puddles everywhere, it's kind of an indication that it could have rained recently. So something like, you know, usually when there are puddles everywhere, it rained recently. Uh, oftentimes when there are puddles everywhere, it recently rained, right? That sort of statement would be inductive because we're not making a guarantee. We're saying things like, you know, usually, oftentimes, sometimes, yeah. If I said the lights are dim, therefore the battery is weak, well, I'm trying to convince you that the, the, the battery is weak. What's the evidence? The light is dim, right? Light's dim on my flashlight. So the conclusion is that battery is weak, premise, lights are dim. So we need some sort of relationship between the lights being dim and the battery being weak. So since we're looking for an inductive argument, we can say stuff like, you know, oftentimes when the, um, the lights are dim, the battery is weak. Uh, sometimes when my light is kind of dim, the battery is weak. You know, um, frequently when I notice my lights are dim, it turns out the battery is weak. Right? These all are statements that imply one or the other. Number three, um, Simpson's blood matched the blood on the glove found at the victim's condo. He killed her. Chances are most of us that are uh, watching this video are... are Probably um, too young to remember what this refers to. But Simpson's blood matched the blood on the glove found at the victim's condo. He killed her. So the conclusion is that he killed her. The reason to believe that is that Simpson's blood matched the blood found uh, on the glove at the victim's condo. So uh, you can say something like Simpson's... Oh, I'm sorry. You can say something like most likely, Simpson's blood wouldn't match that on the glove found at the victim's condo if Simpson hadn't killed her, right? That is a statement that ties those two ideas of uh, killing somebody and the blood <clears throat> and blood evidence. <clears throat> Sorry for being so gruesome with number three. Number four, of course it would be cold tomorrow. It's been cold all week, hasn't it? Okay, so what they want us to believe is that it will be cold tomorrow. The reason they give us the premise is that it's been cold all week. So that's the evidence to support the idea that it will be cold tomorrow. So the unstated premise is a claim that ties the idea of past uh, evidence leading to, the, to the, uh, something about the future. So the next day after a week of cold weather usually is cold, right? The next day after a week of cold weather often is cold. Uh, it's been, it's usually the case that after a week of cold weather, the next day is, is cold, right? Those are all premises that aren't stated but are kind of implied and they would make the argument inductive. Uh, so hopefully you notice there's lots of ways you can think of an unstated premise to make an argument deductive. Uh, number five, Amaroff isn't very good with animals. I doubt he'd make a great parent. Okay, so the conclusion is that this person would not make a great parent. Why? The premise is that Abramoff isn't very good with animals. So you need a, for the unstated premise, you need some sort of statement that ties the idea of not being good with animals with the idea of being a great parent. So something along the lines of, you know, most people who aren't good with animals aren't good with children. Lots of people who aren't good with animals are not good parents. Right? People who are not good with animals usually don't make great parents. So lots of ways to phrase this uh, to make it an inductive argument. Okay. When we come back in our next lecture, we'll take a look at how to analyze arguments in a more graphical way. Sometimes it's really hard to see how an argument works, what the premises are, how they lead to conclusions, just by looking at words. And sometimes it's easier to take a look at a diagram. So we'll learn about how to analyze an argument by the numbers.